Although anecdotes don't usually give much insight to larger trends, I'd like to start with one that stuck with me for a while. I was in ninth grade social studies class, and one of the days we had a debate on affirmative action. I remember it quite vividly for a few reasons. First of all, in a class of around 30 people, I was the only person who supported affirmative action. Mind you, this is a mostly white suburban school, and most of us who went there came from relatively privileged backgrounds. But second of all, after class, the teacher pulled me aside. He said it was good that I was playing devil's advocate, but also lectured me for supporting affirmative action, saying since I was an Asian American student, it would come back to hurt me in the future. And that's something that I've definitely remembered to this day. Now I think that I've learned and grown a lot since ninth grade, I sure hope so, and my perspectives certainly have changed and will continue to change in the future as well. But largely, I still support affirmative action and the principles behind it, although it's a lot more nuanced than just saying that it's good or bad. I think the debate around affirmative action points to a lot of systemic problems in the United States, but also larger global trends as well. So today, with a looming Supreme Court decision that could very well strike down affirmative action, I'd like to take a more comprehensive view at one of America's most controversial policies and examine its positive and negative impacts to try to understand if there's a way that we can better construct our relationship regarding race in education and the workplace. Hi, I'm Felix. I want to start off by saying that this video isn't meant to reinforce anybody's viewpoints. But regardless of if you support or dislike affirmative action, hopefully this video will give you more to think about. Before we jump into this debate about affirmative action, we should fundamentally understand what it means. On an elementary level, affirmative action is considered the policy of favoring individuals who belong to traditionally disadvantaged, discriminated against, and marginalized groups in the process of education and workplace hiring. Affirmative action was largely set out in two executive orders. Executive Order 10,925 was signed by President Kennedy in 1961, which required government contractors to take affirmative action to ensure that applicants are employed and employees are treated without regard to their race, creed, color, or national origin. And Executive Order 11,246 signed by President Lyndon B. Johnson required government employers to take affirmative action to ensure that applicants are employed and that employees are treated during employment without regard to their race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Essentially, what these executive orders laid out was the principle of increasing the participation of minorities and women in the workforce, given the expected amount of qualified minorities and women who could hold these positions in a government or government-contracted job. Affirmative action can be achieved by setting quotas for certain groups, creating specific marketing campaigns for certain groups, such as community outreach, advertising, etc. It can also be achieved by lowering selection criteria to a certain target audience. The addition of sex as an amendment to Executive Order 11,246 through Executive Order 11,375 is an often overlooked part of affirmative action. We often think of affirmative action as a race-based thing now, and while that's largely true today, it originally had a huge impact on increasing employment and educational outcomes for women, particularly white women. Again, this is because employers and institutions often discriminated against the hiring of women, even if they were qualified or had the potential to be qualified for certain roles. Throughout the 70s and 80s, white women's share of jobs in professional occupations rose by 9.3%, largely because of their larger access to becoming a federal contractor through affirmative action. By the 80s under Reagan, and I'll definitely be talking more about Reaganomics in a future video, affirmative action's impacts were slowed down. Nine states have already imposed restrictions of affirmative action at public universities. Interestingly enough, and at the time more white and conservative California, voted to ban affirmative action nearly 30 years ago at public universities, being the first state to do so. More on California later. Eight other states have imposed similar types of restrictions, being Arizona, Florida, Idaho, Michigan, Nebraska, New Hampshire, Oklahoma, and Washington, which is a wide array of states by ideology and geography. Now, before we dive into more of the data and my analysis and opinion on affirmative action, I have to bring in one more anecdote. I'm so sorry, but I will use data to back this one up. A few days ago, I was scrolling Twitter and saw that UC Berkeley was trending. That's where I currently go, so naturally I was pretty curious to see what this was all about. So the whole deal about this is that this Florida high schooler named John Wang, an Asian American, went on Fox Nation to complain about his lack of mission to some of the nation's top schools, including UC Berkeley. 
Look, I'm not going to attack John Wang, but please don't have such a fragile ego. In high school, Wang achieved a 1590 score on the SAT and a 4.65 GPA. Don't get me wrong, that is extremely impressive and shows a high level of academic achievement, but that does not entitle him to get into any of the top universities in the country. Affirmative action aside, universities don't just look at your test scores and GPA, but instead use a ho more holistic approach to admissions, taking into account extracurriculars, work experience, volunteer experience, athletics, and essays, among other things. There are also some less savory things, like if you're a legacy admit. More on that later as well. I don't know how engaged Wang was in his school life, clubs, and his community, so I can't judge, but his SAT score and GPA would never be the single determinants of his admittance to any top school in the nation. And let's just look at the admissions rate for the top schools he applied to. MIT 4%, Caltech 4%, Princeton 4%, Harvard 3%, Carnegie Mellon 14%, and my school, UC Berkeley, at a super high 13%. A couple of caveats here. First, many of these numbers are from a couple years ago, so these rates have probably gone down further since. And second, UC Berkeley doesn't even have affirmative action. We established earlier that California banned affirmative action admissions to the UC system almost 30 years ago. If you'd rather think in fractions, we can do that too. For Berkeley, a 13% acceptance rate means that about 1 in every 8 applicants was admitted. And for Harvard, a 3% acceptance rate means that under 1 in every 30 applicants was admitted. John Wang, nothing against you, but are we really going to call out affirmative action for your lack of admission to a school where one out of every 30 applicants are admitted? Come on, let's just do the math there. And the best part of this story is he ends up going to Georgia Tech, which is an amazing STEM school that specializes in computer science and engineering and has an 18% acceptance rate. Georgia Tech is literally a dream school for a lot of people. John, you should start a comedy special because you are getting a world-class education at an amazing school that a lot of people would want to go to. And you're still complaining. And he will probably be making six figures straight out of college after getting an amazing degree there. I said I wasn't going to attack him, but I'm sorry, I can't sympathize with somebody who's complaining after getting into one of the very best universities in the world. Sorry for the rant, and shout out to Georgia Tech. But does affirmative action actually discriminate against Asian Americans? May John Wang, I didn't get into a 3% acceptance rate school. Have a fair point to make. Well, it depends on how you look at it. First, let's establish that Asian Americans are generally overrepresented at the nation's top universities. At leading schools like Harvard, or Berkeley, or Georgia Tech for that matter, the percent of Asian students significantly outpaces both statewide and nationwide demographics. Now, why is this the case? Well, a few reasons. First, let's establish that Asian American is a very, very wide net to cast. It includes everyone from Kurds to Pakistanis to Filipinos to Koreans and so many more. But by and large, Asian Americans tend to get into these top schools at higher rates because they are generally higher achieving students. We see this play out in standardized tests and school GPAs, and unfortunately, in many societal stereotypes as well. From a young age, my Caucasian peers made it a clear expectation that I should be the smart one. And that goes into another point. Cultural factors are a huge determinant of educational outcomes as well. And in many Asian American households, school is seen as a top priority. This is good in some situations, but you could also argue that this heavy emphasis on book smart education can be stifling to a student's creative and social development as well. Also, when we look at Asian Americans, another reason why I think their children are largely more educationally successful is because the parents are more educationally successful and that's the only reason why their parents are in the U.S. Barring refugees from war and early Asian immigrants brought in for cheap labor, many Asian immigrants were specifically recruited or let into the United States because of their high educational achievements and professional or technical skills that they possessed. Kind of a brain drain from other countries across the world into the U.S. The U.S. was selective about the people that they let in, so naturally, the high-achieving immigrants that were permitted to enter the U.S. are the ones who have the financial and educational resources to enable their children to be successful as well. So those cultural and social factors are what I believe primarily drive Asian American educational success. John and many anti-affirmative action protesters do share a fair point that Asian Americans who score well on tests and have high GPAs are more likely to get rejected at top schools as opposed to their black, Latino, and even white counterparts. But I think this fails to consider two major points. First of all, 
test scores are largely correlated with household income, and as we've established, many of these Asian American households are considered high income due to their professional or technical backgrounds. The SAT math score has a 0.22 correlation with household income, and the SAT verbal score has a 0.18 correlation with household income, both demonstrating the positive relationship that SAT scores have with household income. This is not to say that SAT scores are not a valuable piece of understanding a student's aptitude. They've been shown to have some level of effectiveness on understanding a student's possible achievements. But it is to say that coming from a higher income family generally corresponds with the ability to achieve a higher SAT score. Why do I think this is the case? Well, if your family has more income, that likely means you went to a better public or even private school, perhaps one that also focused on test and college prep. Maybe you could afford a private tutor, or at least had reliable internet access to religiously practice tests on Khan Academy, which was my approach. Perhaps you didn't need an after school or summer job because your family had a high income, so you had more time to study. These are all potential reasons why higher household income drives SAT scores up that perhaps doesn't have to do with the intelligence or potential of a student. Next, racial, social, and financial diversity is a huge asset to college campuses and to the workplace, and I think that's something that is being missed by these anti-affirmative action groups. Okay, I know diversity is something that has been thrown around a lot recently, seemingly a quota that companies and colleges have to fill, but it has so many positive impacts. Peer-to-peer -peer impacts is one of the biggest positive impacts that diversity has. I visited Duke this past year, and while the school is amazing, it just kind of felt wrong to me. Everything felt so insulated from the real world. It was preppy, most students came from really affluent backgrounds, and it just felt out of touch. Bring diversity, particularly financial diversity, to a campus like that could seriously enhance the college experience by allowing students to gain a more critical understanding of their privileges and of societal dynamics. But this positive impact of diversity extends well into the classroom as well. Its impact is obvious when we're talking about majors like public policy. It's important that our future lawmakers, lobbyists, and corporate overlords understand how their actions will impact working class families, who are largely the main people impacted by government policies. And we can enable this by making sure that student populations and educator populations at least somewhat resemble the populations who are largely impacted by government policies. But this extends into STEM fields as well. For example, in data science, data ethics is super important. It's crucial to recognize that not everybody in this country has the same level of access to technology as others. It's also important to think about other factors. How will surveillance technology impact policing in lower income communities and either strengthen or break trust among community leaders? How does data collection impact how advertising is conducted towards different demographics? How can improving Wi-Fi access provide outside of school educational opportunities to communities that traditionally have not had access to the internet? These are just a sample of questions that we need to ask in the STEM field, and instead of being high and mighty and pretending like we should know all the answers, we should instead consult and work with the people who come from and will impact these lower income or predominantly black communities in the future. Diversity isn't just a keyword for liberal arts students to have fun with and pretend like they have moral high ground. It's everywhere. It's in medicine, in technology, in city planning, in environmental studies. Diversity has a real impact on how we can improve equity in our society and improve everyone's lives on a broader scale. Affirmative action is also important on an individual level. Let's not forget that affirmative action needed to be instituted because of racist policies that largely targeted the African American population of this country. Of course, we can talk all day about the de jure segregation of the South that persisted until the 60s, but let's not ignore how many post-World War II policies and subsidies to support GIs, which led to the period of greatest increase in household income for white families, were targeted or exclusively available for white Americans. Let's not ignore how post-World War II housing developments, like Levittown in Pennsylvania, initially did not let African American families move in, enforcing a de facto type of neighborhood segregation, that often forced African-American families to move to worse-off neighborhoods in terms of education, environment, safety, and location, not to mention city redlining laws that, while outlawed now, contributed to where African-Americans were expected or even forced to live, and largely still live today. While conservatives love to talk about trickle-down economics, these are real trickle-down effects that actually impact people's lives to this day. This is where the talk about equality versus equity comes in. 
If African Americans start on a significantly lower level, and they do, having an average household net worth at one-eighth the value of a white household, they would never be able to catch up with equality-only policies. Under an equity approach, which are proactive policies such as affirmative action, well, there's definitely some more hope. Enabling African American students to go to elite colleges can help set up generational wealth, which will have ripple effects, providing a better future for the next generation of African American students. Only generations down the line can we truly be having fair conversations about how to implement equality. Okay, maybe you get what I'm saying but still have this perspective. Diversity is great, but Asian Americans and white Americans are still victims of affirmative action. I think the bigger picture to all of this though, is that we're using affirmative action as a scapegoat for the fact that the whole college admissions process is really, really messed up. For example, let's look at Harvard's class of 2022, which graduated last year. Thanks to a lawsuit that was actually about anti-Asian affirmative action at Harvard, we got some more insight to this graduating class. In this class, African American students, the largest benefactors of affirmative action, made up 10.7% of the graduates. Meanwhile, 36% of Harvard 2022 graduates were legacies, meaning that one or more of their parents attended Harvard. Now, of course, a decent amount of these legacy students probably did deserve to get into Harvard. But let's consider, in addition to the fact that they had that legacy connection, they were probably better off socioeconomically because their parents went to Harvard. This likely means that they were raised in a rich household that gave them plenty of attention and education. They had connections to rich and powerful people, and they were just generally likely very well off in the first place. And this is in addition to the fact that they are Harvard legacies. As a matter of fact, roughly three quarters of ALDC applications, which stands for Athletics, Legacies, Developmental Cases, which just means their parents were donors, and children of employees at Harvard, would have been denied admission if they didn't fall into these categories. To me, it is ridiculous that we are blaming affirmative action for biased admissions at these top schools when legacies make up a much larger portion of the student population and were largely found to only have been able to get into Harvard because their parents went there or donated a handsome amount to the school. Now, from a business perspective, you can't blame Harvard for making this decision. Accepting these types of students is good for donations in the future, but it's clearly a red flag when it comes to equal admissions and a much bigger hindrance to the admittance of Asian American students than affirmative action has been or ever will be. Going back to the case of John Wang, I think it is an unfair and biased conservative talking point to scapegoat affirmative action as to the reason why he couldn't get into Harvard, as opposed to legacy admissions, which has a much larger impact on the makeup of Harvard's student body. And this is not a Harvard exclusive issue. Among Ivy League institutions, roughly 25 to 35% of any given year's class is made up of legacy students. Again, some deserve to get in, but the majority of legacies got in just because their parents did 30 years ago. The rich and powerful are the ones benefiting once again. To me, legacy admissions should be the first to go if we're actually talking about completely fair admissions. Okay, I know I've done a lot of complaining during this video. So how should we actually fix the broken college admission system? Because I think we can all agree that no institution should have an acceptance rate below 5%. At that point, I'm sure you're missing out on a lot of qualified candidates, like John Wang. Well first, let's get rid of legacies. Easier said than done, because again, these are the rich and powerful people that colleges rely on for donations. But instead of beefing up endowment numbers, colleges should actually focus on creating the best group of next generation leaders and thinkers. Next, increase the size of colleges and universities across the country. The population both domestically and internationally, has continued to increase, but many elite school sizes have not kept up with these trends. We shouldn't be keeping educational opportunities away from people to keep the guise of exclusivity. Of course, there are logistical issues when it comes to increasing size, such as needing more housing, buildings, and staff, but that leads me into my next point. Promote and fund state schools more. State schools are generally much more affordable and can provide great educational experiences. We shouldn't be framing the Ivy Leagues and Stanfords of the world as the only top schools that we want our children to go to. Realistically, places like Georgia Tech are amazing schools and more states should take in the path of developing high quality, specialized institutions, whether for STEM or for the liberal arts. Next, as for college applications, put a cap on the amount of schools that students can apply to on the common application 
which is the main portal for applying to colleges in the U.S. Currently, students can apply to as many colleges as they want to, with the only consequence being application fees, which colleges love to collect. But let's cap applications to less than 10, 8, or even 5 per person, with the exception of public state schools. This will cause people to be more thoughtful about what colleges they want to go to, as opposed to going with a shotgun strategy, which drives up admission rates for all colleges, something I know I was guilty of. Look, a lot of these things would be largely unpopular. They would drive down certain revenues for colleges and increase public expenses. But these ideas are a worthwhile investment into the future of our country and improves educational access and equity for all people. I have obviously avoided touching on affirmative action, the main topic of this video, but I do think the ideas that I've just presented make admissions a better process for everyone. Okay, but finally, what do I think about affirmative action after going through the college applications gauntlet and no longer in that ninth grade classroom? Breaking news, if you couldn't tell through this video, I'm still for it. And I know the Supreme Court will probably knock it down. And it's not a perfect system. The fact is that the majority of Americans, most people that I know, are against affirmative action. I think that conservatives have done a great job painting the picture as whites and Asians versus blacks and Latinos. But diversity completely matters on every college campus and in every workplace. It's not just about putting together a nice pamphlet for people to see your diversity. As I've touched on, diversity is crucial in an academic and social setting. And furthermore, affirmative action is a critical tool in increasing socioeconomic mobility for some of America's most marginalized populations. Let's not forget that white women were some of the biggest early benefactors of affirmative action. Unfortunately, affirmative action is probably gone because of the current conservative makeup of the Supreme Court, with this ruling likely coming in the next few days or weeks. But are there ways we can continue to defend the diversity of our college campuses? Yeah, and here are some ideas I have. I personally still think factoring in race is important because we are still de facto a largely segregated country, whether we'd like to admit it or not. Opponents of affirmative action make a fair point that the policies do benefit rich black students the most out of any group. This is a fair point, but not completely true. Again, referring back to the Harvard case, African-American students were 50% less likely to come from families that earned over $250,000 a year. And even if we consider the fact that rich black students are the largest benefactors, it's undeniable that rich black students and rich white students face a different American educational experience. This Northwestern study finds that from the preschool level, teachers are more likely to discipline black preschoolers as opposed to white preschoolers. Keep in mind, this study was conducted in a lab setting, giving more credence to the results. Good research to read if you want to learn more about race and psychology in the educational system from an educator's perspective. And above all, as I've touched on before, it's important to bring together people from different backgrounds to create a more comprehensive discourse at our top institutions. Putting race aside, I think the best factor that we can use is household income. I think we can all respect the idea that people who come from less privileged backgrounds, regardless of their race, deserve greater opportunities if they have demonstrated perseverance and the ability to grow. We can achieve more financial-based admissions by either directly measuring parents' economic status or by proxy means, such as looking at average household income in certain neighborhoods. This is similar to what the University of California system has done to try to ensure that Black and Latinos are fairly admitted to UCs. And while both Black and Latino admissions have dropped since affirmative action in California was banned, for those who were admitted, they saw higher achievements in terms of graduation rates and school performance. This is a positive sign that using financial data as an indicator of a student's background might be a really powerful tool to measure their potential and ability to bring a diverse perspective into higher education. Just as I said how rich white and rich black students have different experiences in the American educational system, rich white and poor white, rich black and poor black, and rich Asian and poor Asian students often experience vastly different education in terms of their access to good schooling, outside resources, community centers, and technology, among many other factors. Using family income might not be as good of a factor as race-based affirmative action because it doesn't consider the historical impacts of race on education. But if affirmative action goes away as we know it, it will likely be the best possible alternative, and I hope that we can see it implemented on a national level. Another factor that deserves more attention is if somebody's parents went to college or not. Because again, greater educational opportunities 
reap greater rewards for people who have traditionally had less access to them. Take a high-achieving individual from a rich family from Harvard to a state school, and they will probably still succeed in life because they have the financial and social resources to fall back on. Take somebody who might only get into state school under no affirmative action to someone who can now get into Harvard? Well, now they have access to a greater network of peers, professionals, and educators. That is a huge opportunity that could change a family's trajectory for generations to come. Affirmative action is, in my mind, a big factor to creating a more equitable overall society. And even if it is going away, we need to use these proxy measures to ensure that social and economic mobility in America is actually something that can be achieved by the masses. I hope that through this video, I've demonstrated that we shouldn't pit affirmative action as a villain, but rather greedy colleges and America's rich and powerful as the reason to why admissions are largely considered unfair. I hope that I've demonstrated that there are huge merits to improving diversity on a society-wide and individual level. And I hope that I've presented the idea that there are potential ways we can improve the college admissions process, both on a level that doesn't consider race, but also on a level that represents the challenges and opportunities that people who have lower socioeconomic standing face and why they might benefit from getting into top schools. If you found this video informative, I'd really appreciate if you gave it a like and subscribe. It's been my pleasure, and I'll see you soon.